1930. In New York Harbor, an escorting armada of honor clusters about a battered, weather-beaten bark, home from an historic exploration of the Antarctic. Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd is in command, first man to conquer the North and South Poles by air. Millions of New Yorkers turned out in a thrilling tribute to the daring explorer whose achievements had won the admiration and acclaim of the entire world. 23 years after he rode in triumph up Broadway, Admiral Byrd speaks to the students of America. Greetings to you, my young friends. I am glad for this chance to tell you something about the top of the world and perhaps about something about the bottom of the world, too. The North Polar Sea is surrounded by frozen continents. The Antarctic continent is surrounded by frozen seas. The south, the bottom of the world, is considerably colder than the top of the world. The south is as cold as people think the north is. Why did we explore? Why did we go to the top of the world? As long as there remains anything unknown on the face of this earth we live on, man is going to go after it to try to find out what it is to attempt to conquer it and to learn how to live in it. Little did I think when we flew to the North Pole in 1926, this area, the contiguous islands and waters to our flight to the pole would become one of the most important strategic areas on the face of the earth. Below is the actual North Pole, the top of the world. The plane returns after anxious hours to the expedition's base at Spitsbergen. In 16 hours, the flight had accomplished what Perry's heroic sled journey had taken more than a year to do. Admiral Byrd and pilot Floyd Bennett had blazed an aerial trail across the Arctic. I myself think we have a good chance to avoid war. But if we, unfortunately, God forbid, do have a war, much of it will be fought across the top of the world, across the pole. It is very important that we get prepared to fight in the bitter coal and to utilize mechanized units there and to have bases uh, near the pole because it is uh, close and has strategic position with reference to our potential enemy. As the world continues to shrink with an ever-increasing acceleration, the northern areas will become important for human habitation. It's becoming warmer up there. I believe myself the whole world is becoming warmer. Now, why is the South Pole important? Why do we go down there? It is because the bottom of the world is an untouched reservoir of natural resources. Southward Ho, the start of one Admiral Byrd's six expeditions to study the weird wonders of the amazing Antarctic. Later, Byrd charts the course as the ship, her masts outlined against a scarred ice wall, nears the end of a 14,000-mile journey. The sea is strewn with loose, broken ice, but the sturdy ship crunches steadily on to her improvised berth against the ice barrier. Ashore in Antarctica, the White Continent. Soon scouts are searching for the snow-smothered site of earlier camps. Proudly, old glory is run up to fly again over little America. The local inhabitants look on. Blocks of snow melted down in subsurface vats provide water for the camp. It's a tedious process. Two gallons of snow yield barely two quarts of water. The friendly penguin is among the most hardy and primitive of birds. Of all the animals who roamed the once tropical Antarctic continent, he alone has survived. A little supervisor in full dress, lord over a lifeless wasteland, slumbering still in the ice age that gripped the northern hemisphere 30,000 years ago. This is Little America, the southernmost city in the world. 
By air, man has explored vast chunks of the Antarctic six million square miles. Admiral Byrd returns from a scouting flight with only minutes to spare. A savage blizzard is about to strike. Whirling up from the pole, as all storms here do, it brings ice-edged snow lashed by fierce winds. In their shelter below, members of the expedition study photographs taken on Bird's flight. Above, the storm reaches full fury. Navigation class underground learns more of the world's coldest, windiest continent, where temperatures reach 90 below and winds 200 miles an hour. Preserving food in storage lockers is no problem here. Many experts envision the Antarctic as a huge deep freeze cabinet. Surplus food could conceivably be stored with assurance that it would be there hundreds of years later. Meat freezes so hard that it must be chopped with an ax. The fury of the storm is spent. The men can now reclaim the frozen world above. Except for a thick, fresh frosting of snow, there is no change. Crews soon are at work digging out. A tractor is freed from its cocoon of snow. Man and machines have conquered the Antarctic wastes. Dog sleds carrying vital information collected on the expedition and their drivers abandon Little America and return to the ships now being loaded. Those longtime friends of the bird expeditions, the penguins, say goodbye. The natural resources of the Antarctic must be left behind. Coal, oil, uranium, and penguins. Ahead, the long voyage home. I think it's important for us to explore that area, important for the human race, to find out what's there. That is why when this crisis is over, uh, we expect to go back. Perhaps uh, some of you students who are hearing this talk may volunteer to go back with us. We'll be glad to have you. Some of us may answer this call to adventure and journey with Admiral Byrd back to the poles, truly the ends of the earth.